Hello, in this brief video, we are going to discuss Presidential Leadership Style and Political Use of Force by Keller and Foster. So to recap, we have examined the presidential use of force over the evolution of the study of it over the last, really kind of the 90s and then this piece. But we see from Ostrom and Job, I guess in the 80s, to James and O'Neill, to Fordham, that how we understand when presidents use force evolves. It changes as we discover new ideas or new theories or, or generate them depending on epistemology. What this paper does is it introduces something about personality and the fact that presidents are singular individuals. They're individuals who make that choice. Now I'm not going to read this obviously, but remember all of the non-video slides are available in Canvas. So if you want to have them up instead of pausing a video, or sometimes there will be slides where this video will be covering a few things, remember the non-slides are available in Canvas. When we think about this article, one thing that you have to take away with it is diversionary uses of force, right? So whether a, a president uses force to distract the public or to demonstrate competence or to try to win a domestic election, gambling for his erection, then it sounds so good. It's such a convincing story. But there is limited evidence for it, and some of it's inconsistent. Now, obviously, we have not read nearly, we've only put our, our toe into the literature on diversionary use of force, but I want to use it to identify the evolution of ideas or how ideas evolve in science through the scientific method. What this paper introduces is personal identification of risk. And what they do is they borrow from psychology this concept of locus of control. And this refers to one's belief about whether one's outcomes are determined by your own effort. You have an internal locus, right? What happens in my life is because of what I do. I mean, there's other out, you know, outside factors on, on the periphery, but most of it is what I decide to do. The other, an external locus of control, is that you, you know, the world shapes the events, Whatever happens to you is not because of anything you've done. It's because of how the system works. So if you think from a presidential level, are you are you a president that says, I shape history or does history shape me? Um, what are the events in my administration? How does it affect you? Well, what they argue is that two traits, whether it's controlling events right, or self-confidence, that those two personality traits help construct an internal locus of control. So the higher that you think your ability to control events and the higher your self-confidence, the more that you have a, an internal locus of control. They argue that presidents that have higher levels that, of that internal will be particularly likely to engage in diversionary actions. Now why? Well, because they control events. Think of it especially as it relates to escalation. If you are a president that says, well, whatever happens to me is a consequence of the world and I don't really shape events, you'd be much more risk averse because you can't control what may happen. If you're an internal locus of control president, you would say, well, this might start a war, but I'm going to do it because I think I control events. The research design, this is an important piece. Part of the reason why I use this is that Next week, we'll look at Howell and PV House, but we've already looked at the dependent variable. So we have multiple studies that use the same dependent variable with different explanatory variables. We want to understand why presidents use force. No one paper will tell us that. Right? That's part of the scientific method. No one paper is definitive. Well, we have we can compare maybe not because of all of the controls but we can directly compare at least the dependent variable the time samples on some of them do change so it's 1953 to 2000 um, it's also going to be quarterly as mentioned now there is an interaction term and this is based on gdp change and approval change so we should be able to to think through why would they use the change in gdp as it relates to locus of control. Remember back to Benjamin Fordham's piece where it is not Republican or Democrats' direct effect on using force. It's not the direct partisanship. 
It's that interaction that between their elite and the mass public, when those two preferences don't align, that different partisan presidents will choose action. Okay, so remember, what we're, what we're saying here is not just, oh, you have an internal use locus of control, you just automatically use force. Like, oh, the military is always the answer. That's not what they're, that's not what they're saying, it's certainly not what I'm saying. What, what they are arguing, or at least I would, my interpretation of their, of their article, is that under certain conditions, just like Benjamin Fordham, under certain conditions, certain personality types are more likely to use force than not. Okay, the evidence or the data comes from the public papers of the presidents of the United States. This is an important um, database of terms. Anytime the president speaks in public or communicates in public or releases a statement or tweets, it's documented. So what they're saying here is they're gonna we're gonna code presidents some aspects of presidents' personalities. There's two. You should go back through the slides if you don't remember to identify where the president lands. How do they do that? This is a, a fascinating coding process. They it's a digital coding process where they look for for key terms, keywords, developed on psychology and groupings of words, and what this slide will show you as you read through it is think about if you accept how they code the explanatory variable. How do you measure self-confidence? How do you measure the ability to control events? Now thankfully, as a political scientist I say thankfully, we have psychology as a whole field and sociology and anthropology uh, that, can, that gives us great insight into how to construct these. But I want you to look through, what do you think of how that's coded? Next, I want you to think about the group, the, the presidents that are covered by the data. Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton. Uh, I was about to start singing that. My daughter knows the presidents because we have one of the songs for them. Um, and it ends in Clinton, so we have to add a whole bunch. Um, because the tune doesn't line up with the number of presidents. But which of those presidents do you think is going to have internal versus external control? Which of the presidents say, I can control events? Any presidential scholars out there? Don't worry, I got this wrong too the first time I read it. Well, what were the results? Now remember, these are the marginal effects. These are not the direct effects of their personality. These are, in this case, is GDP change. So as GDP changes, what happens? So how to interpret this graph? Look at the solid line. This is when there is GDP contraction at 6%, which is really high, which is coronavirus high. When So when you think about that, that's an adverse event. Domestically, that presidents may want to use diversionary force or there might be other things going on that they want to utilize. Well, that solid line is when you have contraction. Look at the presidents. Minimum locus of control versus maximum. And here's why I think the study is so fascinating. Right? Look at the two presidents who have the most locus of control or external locus of control, or internal, I mean, where they, they think they control the events. Reagan and Kennedy. Right? So whether you're conservative or liberal or Republican or Democrat, what this is showing us is partisanship matters. They're not saying it doesn't. But personality does. And I would argue that if you asked most Republicans who the best president of the 20th century would be, Reagan's probably up there. If you ask Democrats, probably FDR first, or Kennedy, one of those two probably. right? But they both behave similarly, are predicted to have behaved similarly, given the economic conditions. Hmm fascinating piece. Okay, what the other two lines show you is when you change GDP, the increase in the likelihood, which is measured in the axis going up, right, so you can think of that as the slope of the lines, they become less steep as GDP doesn't change as dramatically. What that tells us is that GDP affects how presidents use force. What? <laughs> Shouldn't the use of force be separate from? 
yeah, well, you get to answer that in a discussion or address that in a discussion board. All right, so what does this brief introduction to this article tell us? It tells us about diversionary theory, it tells us about presidential uses of force. Also, I hope, gives us a, a sense of the scientific process for how knowledge is generated. I don't think we're actually near scientific knowledge as it relates to the use of force, but we're getting closer. And what this piece tells us is if we don't look at who is in office, their characteristics, their beliefs, we may have a poor understanding of the decision-making process for the use of force. Something to think about. There's a presidential election this year. How does personality at least as it relates to locus of control, potentially shape how either candidate may behave in office. That's it. I think there's a fascinating article. Um, really enjoy it. I think it's challenging when we think that partisanship is not the only thing. It's important. I'm not downplaying it. I'm simply saying it's, there's other things that matter and how we study the use of force. Thanks.